Now, we all know that when glass gets cold, it attracts condensation. Uh, and you may think you know why, but I've got a riddle for you. Think about your car for a moment. Have you ever gone out in the morning and your car windshield is covered in dew, but not the side windows? That doesn't really make sense, right? If glass getting cold is what is causing the condensation to form on the glass, then is the windshield somehow colder than the side windows? That doesn't make sense if they're both attached to the same car, wouldn't they be the same temperature? They're both immersed in the same atmosphere that and they sh shouldn't be any colder than the ambient temperature. So what's going on here? Why does dew form here, but not over here? Kind of weird. So I've got some answers for you, and I'm also going to show you some tips and tricks on how you can keep dew off of your telescope so your night doesn't get ruined like mine did. So stay tuned. We're going to do some science. We're going to start by taking apart the water molecule and seeing what makes it tick. First, we need to understand that water is a polar molecule. Now that means that one side of the molecule is slightly more positively charged than the other side. Because of this imbalance, when multiple water molecules are in proximity to one another, those opposite charges start attracting each other. The oxygen end of one molecule is being drawn toward the hydrogen end of another molecule. This attraction is actually pretty strong and results in water's characteristic surface tension. A water strider is an insect that takes advantage of this sticky property of water. You can even observe the phenomenon yourself by filling a glass to the top with water and then slowly adding a little more. Notice how you can see the water actually rise above the brim of the glass. This is called the meniscus, and it's caused by the electromagnetic stickiness of the water gripping both the edges of the glass as well as holding on to other water molecules. Now that we understand the polar nature of water, let's set that aside for a moment and talk about the essence of temperature. What does it mean if something is hot? Now, you obviously know if something is hot or cold, it's instinctually built into us. But have you ever really thought about what hot and cold really is? Like, what's happening at the most basic level to make something hot or cold? Well, it turns out temperature is actually a measure of the average kinetic energy of a substance. In other words, if the atoms in the substance are moving around really fast, then we would perceive that substance as being hot. Likewise, if the atoms are moving slowly, then we perceive it as being cold. When a substance like water gets hot, those molecules start moving so fast that the electromagnetic attraction between individual water molecules isn't strong enough to hold them together anymore, and the molecules separate. It's sort of like children on a merry-go-round. They try to hold on, but if that thing spins fast enough, then they'll lose their grip and, well, let's just say that they'll test all three of Newton's laws all at once. Individual water molecules that break off from the pack are said to evaporate, and it's at this point that the liquid water has transitioned into water vapor. As we cool the air off, the movement of the water molecules becomes less intense. Thus, if two of them bump into each other, they may not ricochet quite as far as they did before, and the entire volume of gas will start to contract and become more dense. In this demonstration, I'll be putting hot water inside a bottle and then capping it with a balloon. I'll let the water cool on its own for a bit before placing the bottle in an ice bath to accelerate the process. As the hot water in the bottle cools, it also contracts, decreasing the pressure in the bottle and pulling the balloon inward. Take a look at this diagram. This is called a phase diagram, and it illustrates the temperatures and pressures at which water will freeze, evaporate, or condense. As we discussed, temperature obviously plays into this. And you probably remember from your high school science class that water freezes at zero degrees Celsius and boils at 100 degrees Celsius. But that whole air contracting as it cools thing plays into this as well. In fact, what the phase diagram shows is that the temperature at which water freezes or boils can actually change if the pressure changes. Let's do some experiments to test this out. I'm going to start with water that's just a few degrees shy of its boiling point. You can see the steam, but no rolling bubbles. I'm going to draw some of this hot water into a special syringe equipped with a valve, and then I'll close the valve. 
Initially, you'll see no bubbling inside the syringe because the water isn't at its boiling point, but pulling back on the plunger decreases the pressure of the liquid because it's capped off. According to the phase diagram, this pressure decrease lowers the boiling temperature of the water. Even though the temperature hasn't really changed, the bubbles show that the water spontaneously starts boiling inside the syringe. Consider the air in this room. It can hold a certain amount of water. But how much? Let's pretend that this glass can hold the same amount of water molecules as the air in this room can hold. While the air can hold this much water, you see we haven't actually evaporated that much water into the air. In this example, the air is only half full of water compared to what it's capable of holding. In fact, this is what we call relative humidity. In this example, the relative humidity of the air is 50% because it's half filled to capacity. So let's bust out the old humidifier and start pumping more water vapor into the air. We can see that the air is filling up with water vapor. It's now three-fourths of the way full, or 75% relative humidity. At 100% relative humidity, each molecule of water will be just far enough apart that they won't attract one another and condense into a liquid. At this critical point of 100% relative humidity, I can't add any more water vapor to the air. There just isn't enough room left. Any additional water molecules that you add won't be able to stay far enough away from other water molecules and condensation will start to occur. When air can't hold any more water, we say that it has reached saturation. And the magic temperature at which saturation occurs is called the dew point. Understanding this concept, you should now be able to extrapolate that hot air can hold more water molecules than cold air because the molecules hit each other harder, overcoming the magnetic attractions that we were talking about earlier. In the last scenario, we increase the relative humidity by adding more water to the air. This certainly does happen in nature, but more often than not, large changes in humidity are driven more by changes in temperature. So let's run a new scenario. As before, this glass will represent how much water the air can hold. Only this time, the air is pretty warm, which means it can hold a lot of water. We'll represent that with a big glass. As before, the air is capable of holding a full glass of water, but it's only halfway full, or 50% relative humidity. This time, there is no humidifier. The amount of water in the air isn't going to change. If we start cooling the air off, then the amount of water the air can hold starts to decrease. In other words, the glass is getting smaller to represent the fact that the cold air can't hold as much water as the warm air could. Notice the amount of water in the air hasn't changed, but because the glass got smaller, it's now three-fourths of the way full. The relative humidity has increased to 75%, not because there's more water in the air, but because the ability of the air to hold that quantity of water has decreased. As the temperature continues to decrease, the air will continue to be able to hold less water. Thus, the relative humidity will continue to increase as well until at some magic temperature, we hit 100% relative humidity and the air is once again saturated. And remember, the magic temperature at which the relative humidity reaches 100% is called the dew point. But alas, in our scenario, the temperature continues to drop. What now? As the glass continues to shrink, water will begin overflowing. In other words, excess water the air can't hold will condense into liquid droplets and fall out of the air just like they're going to be spilling out of this glass. If you've been paying attention to this explanation, then something might not be making sense to you. Dew can form on your camera lens or your car windshield even if it's not cloudy. So where did that come from? Let's say that the dew point is 4 degrees Celsius. So we would expect to see fog starting to form if the temperature drops to 4 degrees. But it isn't 4 degrees outside, let's say that it's 10 degrees. Since my telescope and car windshield are also outside and neither one of them have heaters or air conditioners pointed at them, it seems like they should also be 10 degrees, right? I mean, how could something be colder than the ambient temperature? So I shouldn't be seeing any dew on my glass and yet there it is. So what gives? Well, actually it is possible for your glass to be colder than the air around it. 
The question is, how is that possible? Radiation. Infrared radiation, to be exact. You can measure the temperature of a thing by observing how much infrared radiation it emits. As a matter of fact, this is how thermal imaging cameras work. Using this infrared camera, you can see that I'm actually quite a bit warmer than the other objects in this room. One might even say that I'm hot stuff. N no one has ever said that. So what's going on with our glass then? This infrared energy radiates away from all surfaces. Surfaces that are pointed to the sky, like our telescope or the car windshield, radiate that energy directly into space. If you park your car under an awning, you might find that it doesn't collect dew. It's still outside, but as the glass radiates the energy upward, it bounces off the awning and comes back down to the windshield, warming it back up just a little bit. It might still be cold, but that little bit of reflected radiation might just be enough to keep the glass temperature above the dew point. Here we are in front of my house at night. I've got the Christmas lights on here. And you can see there's this little concrete walkway that leads up to my front door. Right now it's about 54 degrees on the concrete walkway. And as we approach this covered area, you can see the roof line right here leading up to the front door. We can see that it's 56 degrees underneath this covered area. And the reason why is that as heat is radiating from this covered area upward, it hits the roof and the roof in turn is also radiating heat downward like this and keeps the ground here a little bit warmer. But if we go outside again, over here where it's not covered, the radiation that is emitted from the concrete walkway just goes straight up into space. So I've gone ahead and parked my truck outside. It's been out here for about an hour. And if we look at the windshield right here, we can see that the windshield is showing up as 33, about 34 degrees. But the side windows are showing up quite a bit warmer, 36 degrees. And if you look at it, um, you can kind of tell why. The windshield is really pointed toward the sky, which is very cold but the side windows are pointed at the neighborhood. And so the neighborhood is radiating a lot of infrared radiation, and some of that is striking the windows and warming them up just a little bit, but just enough to keep them above the dew point. So I've just pulled the uh, truck into the garage and you can see that that little bit of temperature difference did make a difference in terms of dew collection. The windshield does have quite a bit of condensation on it, whereas the side windows are uh, much more clear. Here we're looking at my weather station outside and you can see that while the windshield's temperature was 34, 36 degrees, somewhere around in there, the outside air temperature is 44 degrees. And look at the dew point is 40 degrees. So with the windshield being in the 30s, um, it is below the dew point, and that explains why we're getting condensation on the windshield. This brings us to our first piece of dew fighting hardware, the dew shield. It's basically just a tube that you put on the front of your telescope. The shield is capturing infrared radiation from the glass and reflecting it all around inside of this cylinder, while also preventing breezes from whisking away any uh, heat that has managed to build up. This is a thermal image of my Raza telescope. The Raza is unique because the camera mounts to the front objective of the telescope. So here we're looking down the dew shield length and we can see the camera inside. You can see the camera itself is generating some heat, but notice how that heat is radiating off of the walls of the dew shield and that helps everything inside of the dew shield stay a little warmer. So with a regular telescope, you wouldn't have the camera on the front like this, but the glass itself would still have a certain amount of heat. And just like you see here, that heat would be trapped by the dew shield. If the relative humidity in your area is going to be somewhat low, then a dew shield's probably all you're gonna need. But if the humidity is going to be a little higher, then you might need to bust out the big guns and spring for a second condensation fighting accessory, the dew heater. Instead of relying on the intrinsic heat of the glass and the dew shield to, uh, to keep it trapped, the dew heater is going to actually actively heat your glass and keep it above the dew point. In fact, your car defroster works on the same principle. 
those little lines on your back window are actually wires that heat up. This is why the areas around those lines are always the first to clear up when you first turn your defroster on. This dew heater ring from Celestron contains the same small wire that your car window has. It heats up and in turn heats the glass around it to keep things nice and dry. You could just plug this directly into a 12 volt power source and it will run at full power the whole time, but this actually pulls a lot of power. So if you're running your rig from a small battery, it might use up all of your juice before the night is through. Now, to combat this, you can add the uh, Celestron Smart Dew Heater Controller. Um, this device monitors the ambient temperature and humidity and scales your heater ring output just enough so that it's providing just enough heat to keep your glass dry uh, without using any unnecessary power. You could even use the, the dew heater ring and your smart controller in conjunction with your um, dew shield. That will trap the heat that you're generating and be even more efficient. And efficiency is good because that will let you run your rig uh, for even longer on a single battery charge. The 8-inch version works with both the 8-inch Raza as well as the Celestron C8, and they make them in other sizes as well, including 5, 6, 9.25, 11, and 14 inches. It's easy to install. You simply point the telescope straight up so the corrector plate doesn't move or fall, uh, cover the corrector plate with the included protective paper ring, remove the screws and the corrector plate retaining ring, and be sure not to allow the corrector lens to move while you work. Replace the retaining ring with the dew heater ring, reinstall the screws, and you're done. If you have a refractor telescope, tracking scope, or a camera lens that you're trying to keep dry, then consider a USB-powered Velcro heater strap instead. I got this one from Amazon for relatively cheap, and it works great with both my camera lenses and my tracking scope. It's important to note, however, that the Celestron Smart Controller won't work with third-party dew straps like this. The last thing you need is information. I use an Android app called Clear Outside to tell me if I have good viewing conditions that night. Uh, it's the best weather app that I've found for predicting cloud cover, but it's also pretty good at telling me the dew point and relative humidity. Now, you don't have to use this particular app. Just about every weather app out there will tell you these numbers. Um, if the app is predicting a maximum overnight relative humidity of 50% or less, then I won't bother with any dew control stuff at all. But if the relative humidity is gonna be between 50 and 60%, then I call that the caution zone. And I'm going to start thinking about at least adding a dew shield, or maybe I'm gonna risk it and go with nothing at all. But anything over 60%, and I'm definitely using the shield, and I'm probably busting out the heaters as well. So that's it. You now know all about relative humidity and how to prevent dew from ruining your evening under the stars. I hope that this information was useful to you and that I have earned a subscription. Feel free to check out this video next. I think you'll really like it. And please also consider hitting the like button and the bell and, and feel free to leave me a comment. Not only do I love hearing from you, but all of those things feed the YouTube algorithm and help the channel reach a larger audience. Until next time.